then, like I said, when the press came along, you know, even though everybody was enthused and ready to go and everything, the whole thing in the radio has changed. You know, so we still got our work cut out, but we're doing it the old-fashioned way. Take it straight to the people, like these kind of clubs. We don't even want a spaceship, no nothing. And at that level, we can beat, we can beat up on people. We know the band is great. And so, yeah, we, we, we smart, Alex. You know, so, yeah. uh, if, I guess you could generalize in this way. You could say, like, the 70s were a golden age for you and, and for funk. And then the 80s, uh, things took a turn for the, for the, for the worse. Uh, uh, but now back in the 90s, all of a sudden, you're back in the limelight again. Everybody wants to know who you are and what you're doing. Well, the way we like to look at even the 80s when we weren't doing it, it's like it's a natural progression of things. Um, the whole world is based on playing off of that. I mean, cars got five or six years life. A marriage got about five or six. A suit got about a year and a half. You know what I mean? It's just the world is built like that. And so does entertainers. You know? And so it was something that, you know, normal you know, for a group that hasn't been around. You know, twice before like that, you know, we knew it, it had to end sooner or later for a while, but we didn't think it was over and we never do. So the 80s, we relaxed, you know, and took care of some other things for the next time and just try to prepare to see where the music was going. We watched rap and we saw that it wasn't going anywhere. And then we came, we realized that the sampling was a benefit to us. So. We saw how to use that, you know, start sampling ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, as term for the worst, we like to look at it as a rest period, time to clean house, mm -hmm. something that had to take place. Mm -hmm. It almost seems symbolic that, uh, you know, you got your second big chance from Prince and Paisley Park level, symbolic of all that had happened, how things had kind of come full circle. And Prince's, I guess, his sort of role in, in keeping the funk alive. Um, He's a funketeer. That's the, that's the obligation of a funketeer. <laughs> Whoever's in on top is to reach back and grab the next. And he's one of the, you know, he's one of the few, and he's probably the best, you know, created entity that's been around since the mothership and stuff. He's one of the few that was easy to talk to, you know, especially being as big as he were, as he is. Uh, he was, he's one of the, the few that uh, acknowledge you know, his influences. I mean, a lot of people do, but soon they used to get to the top. They said, we're not funky, you know. Mm. We're pop. Mm. Mm. How did you meet up with him? That was the original question. Oh, wait. What was the exact Back in 76, mm, when he was first, you know, coming around, he used to come to the shows, and he looked like a funky dog, like a funky tear. So he used to come and watch Bootsy all the time, and we used to let him, you know, on stage. And we knew he was making music, we didn't know what music was about. And um, so we knew him, you know, in his early days. And as he, you know, became who he is now, he remembered it. <laughs> Musically involved at all in the Cinderella theory? Uh, not directly, except for the remixes. And uh, he played like, certain instruments, sang a little bit on, on tweaking the remix. Uh, basically, he wanted to stay out of it because he didn't, you know, wanted to look like, you know, he had to, you know, survive and you know, help us survive that way because he believed in, you know, the way we do it. I mean, he still do. And he liked the album. He was already finished with the album when I took it to him. I mean, he had some changes. He asked me to do some certain things, you know, because I asked him, you know, don't get out that easy. You know, give me up some of the tips that you, you know, you're up on now. So, but for the most part, you know, he, he didn't get involved. This album, we've already done two or three things together. The next album, which is called Hey Man, Smell My Finger. So he's already involved in this is already. But he's, he's actually going to be doing something? Well, we've already done three or four cuts already. Right. And he's uh, contributing what way? I mean, he wrote uh, a couple of songs together. He, he played on some of the instruments some of the guys in my band played. He sang on some parts. Um, I mean, always. And we did the movie thing. We did a couple of songs together. One called um, I'm Testing Positive for the Funk. I'll gladly pee in anybody's cup. <laughs> so, I mean, we've been doing a lot of work together lately. <laughs> uh, as funk seems to enter, you know, kind of a, a 
newly found uh, uh, golden age. Are you going to sort of take the reins as the godfather of funk, or is his prince going to be uh, at, the, at the helm there? Who's going to be going to be controlling the mothership? Well, I don't think funk can be controlled like that. I think all of us just have to get on board wherever it takes us, and you know, be a part of it. I'm not the funk. He's not the funk. You know, funk is in us, come through us, and all of that. James Brown, everybody. But um, you can't take the funk. You know, I'm planning to be a part of it. I mean, if he's the one that's out there doing, you know, you know publicly the most, <laughs> I'll be with him, behind him. Hmm. And I guess that's the same way he feels. Because hmm. there's one nation on that group, and you know, like I said, it's up to be anybody. You know, it might be Bootsy. <laughs> but I think we all work with the funk as opposed to us having the funk and, you know, controlling it. It don't be control. <laughs> You know, um, of the various funketeers out there, you always seem to be one of the more uh, humorous ones. There's always sort of an element of the absurd, the, the funny in your music, but you, you kind of take a turn for the serious these days. You know, Cinderella theory seems a little more serious than before. Uh, like the show, you saw the first day of the show, it seemed not quite uh, as, uh, as funny as it used to be. Well, I think that happens <clears throat> each time we make a change, like from the days of... Um, Parliament to Funkadelic, you know, Maggie Payne and all that. People were like, oh shit, whatever they've done, I love them before that. And then from the Maggie Payne, you know, 60s of Free Your Mind and Super Stupid, being a really heavy guitar rock mm -hmm. band with the diapers and sheets. And, you know, even with the mothership and the glitter, the people from the, you know, 68, 69 was like, man, I liked y'all when y'all were psychedelic, you know, when it was the guitar, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the same thing is happening, you know, from the people that saw the mothership and, and you know, that period through Atomic Dog. So, as far as I'm concerned, I think we was more serious through that period, <laughs> even though we made it look silly and stupid than we were this time. Because this time it was totally, from a songwriter's point of view, like the Cinderella theory, the album itself, it was like the music and... You know, from a songwriter's point of view, I meant not to sound like or look like Funkadelic or Parliament. Because, you know, it's, it's hard enough we have nine different groups, <laughs> same members, but it was definitely an attempt to, you know, come another way. And I think the show is like ten times greater now because we don't even have to do it with a mothership, mm. which is a great you know, bit of the expectation. And for some people who've seen that, I can understand it not being the same intensity, but the intensity that we got without it and you know the band's dedication after ten years of not, you know, playing. I don't think we could my mother show right now I think we'd all O D on the funk. I think all of us have to go to funk rehab. You know what I mean? This may be a, a, a false a, a mistaken assumption. But like the way it used to be is you guys were kind of on the fringe there. You know, you, you guys were sort of the, the funk gorillas of, of uh, mm -hmm. pop music, you know. N nobody was doing what you were doing. And you were unusual, radical. Now, a lot of the stuff in the mainstream comes from hip-hop. A lot of it comes from what you started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your very style now is like, uh, you know, just the, the, the average thing to do. Do you think you can still kind of remain on the outskirts there? Can you still come from left field? Or yeah, once we've acquired, you know, and satisfied the very young who's identifying with hip-hop, hip and once we make that connection that they've heard about, that the P-Funk is the founders of all this music that's being used to make hip-hop, once we have established that and can, you know, trust our exposure, that we'll be you know, exploited, in a, and after then we can do all of those things. That stuff comes when momentum is happening. You can do a mothership or a clones of Dr. Funkenstein or One Nation when the momentum is really, you know, gone. Until then, you got to first get the confidence of the people. Do you know this uh, from like 11, 10, 11, round right up through the 22 or 3? Once you've got that, their confidence, you know, right through the, to the college, then you can, you know, I mean, that's our nature to be crazy. You know, and crazy since they so in love with what we did before, it's kind of norm, you know, because it's dealing with our stuff, which didn't get old that fast. It's still new to most people, you know. So if we get a flow going and get momentum going, then we can be able to, like, smell my finger. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> <laughs> you'll just uh, kind of, you know, start out kind of crazy.